The other kind of conceptual introduction to this chapter, I would say, centers around really the idea of annual worth and the idea that we can convert cash flows into annual, an equivalent, let's call it an equivalent annual cash flow. And um, uh, j just, just let's say by way of, of uh, illustration, uh, I can say, you know, if, if, I have, um, if I have some P at time T equal to zero, and then I have some, uh, you know, time horizon that I'm interested in, remember through the concept of equivalence, I can convert that P into um, an equivalent. I'm just going to use the equal sign. I can convert that P into an equivalent annual amount. And the way the patterns of cash flows work are something that I need to remain true to, right? So if we have a P that occurs at time T equal to zero, I can convert that to an A. Okay, so, and, and if I'm using down arrows here, it's just because uh, for, for this chapter, we do tend to focus more on cost, uh, let's say at the very beginning. And, um, and we introduce a concept we call equivalent annual cost. So I like to, I like to talk about cars as an example, because it's something that a lot of people can relate to. Now, if you don't have a car, maybe you have a bicycle, or maybe you have some other asset that you have purchased that you will use over a number of years. And I want you to think about that asset. A, a car is sort of the ideal example. Even if you don't have a car or you don't have any other assets, um, you can still think of it as a car. And I'm gonna put a question out there. If I buy a car for, let's say I buy a really cheap used car for $1,000, I'll, I'll put it up here. Let's say I, I buy a car for $1,000. That's my, my purchase price. And I buy it at t equal, time t equal to zero. If I own that car for, well, let's say if I own that car for four years and interest rates are zero, right? So let's just say interest is equal to 0% just for the moment. What is the equivalent annual cost of a thousand dollar car if I own it for four years, meaning I spread out the cost over, over it. Someone says, what brand? <laughs> um, most like, let's say it's, um, let, let's say it's a, uh, oh, what's that Russian car that no one liked a long time? A, a Lada. I don't know if you've ever heard of that car. Okay. I've got lots of, uh, yeah, thank you. <laughs> Boris, you've got the right name for the Lada. Okay. Um, so let's say I buy a thousand dollar Lada. I don't even know if you can get them anymore. Um, but your, your answer is, 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 is right, right? So, so this becomes an equivalent annual cost of $250. And, you know, conceptually, that's an easy idea. So, so I, could, I could now say, okay, what if I owned that same Lada for... 10 years instead of four years, what's the equivalent annual cost? Right, if I own it, what if I own it for 10 years? Yeah, if, if I owned it for, if I, if I owned this same crappy car for 10 years instead of four years, my equivalent annual cost would be $100. Okay, I hope everyone's up to speed on that, right? So, so if I buy it for if I buy it for a thousand, I own it for four years. My equivalent annual cost is two fifty. If I buy it for amazing value, someone said, "Yeah, it's true." If I own it for ten years, my equivalent annual cost is a hundred dollars. Um, some and some funny comments coming in. Thank you very much. That's but that's good because it means you're listening to what I'm saying. Now, interest rates are never zero percent, right? So so if interest is 10%, or let's say if, if I use a MAR of 10%, um, you know, if, if I use a MAR of 10% and I purchase something for, for $1,000, I own it for four years, my equivalent annual cost 
is now based on the time value of money equation, where A is going to be equal to my purchase price of $1,000 times my A given P factor for 10% and four years. Now I don't know what I don't know what that is, right? But we could we could look it up, and and you'll end up with some. Hey, someone says three hundred and fifteen fifty. Is that correct? So okay, okay, okay. So well, the easy thing about using a purchase price of a thousand is that we can just use the the actual compound interest factor for the i equal to ten for n equal to four, and then we end up with and it sounds about right. I'm just gonna, I'm not even going to look it up. I'm going to trust you, and I think you're probably right. It sounds about right. Now my equivalent annual cost is $315.50. Now, jargon alert. Remember also at the beginning of the course, we introduced these jargon uh, words and they're just words specific to um, you know, this field. Here's the, here's the jargon. We don't call this an A anymore. We call it an EAC. EAC, and it stands for equivalent annual cost. That's it. You know, it's not any more complicated, complicated than that. Well, it, it does actually get more complicated in just a minute. But in terms of the concept, the concept of an equivalent annual cost is just that, right? We're taking a purchase price of an asset, and then we're spreading it out. And, and what do you notice about the EAC, the equivalent annual cost? The longer I own the asset, what happens to the equivalent annual cost? The longer I own the asset, it goes down. Thank you very much. Right. So, so the longer, if I could own that lotta for a thousand years, it would only cost me a, a dollar a year if interest rates were zero. Right. So, so yeah. So, so the longer, and I mean, uh, and that makes sense. That makes sense from an intuitive point of view. If I buy something and it lasts me a long time, it intuitively, it feels like a better investment. So when I express it in terms of an equivalent annual amount, the lower the equivalent annual cost, the better. Okay, this is sort of, so this, yeah, someone said something about a Corolla. I do know people who've owned uh, Toyota Corollas and they, they do get like, you know, own them for 20 years, put 500,000 kilometers on them, right? Great investment, right? Great great investment. The EAC of that Toyota Corolla is very low. Okay. Uh, Camrys are good too. Okay. So, so any questions about the concept of EAC? Because I'm just about to complicate it. Okay. Any, so is everybody okay with this concept? It's, it's based on this, on that concept of equivalence, meaning that in the time value of money world, I can take a P and I can then express it as an A. And for the purpose of this chapter, we just don't use A, we use EAC. Okay, so, so the EAC is, is the same thing, but not quite. So let me give you the, the twist. Now, what it, it is, it's it, right, it's an annuity. So someone has said, we're basically converting a purchase price to an annuity, but hang on, because it does get a little bit more complicated. So uh, someone asked a question too, is, is the value uh, only used for internal decision-making? Well, no, not really. I, I mean, it is used for internal decision-making, but it's a, it's a general concept in the world of finance that is universally applicable. So it's used to simply understand the cost of things. That's really, it, it, let's say it's a means of, spreading out cost over time, including the time value of money, and then finding a common sort of number that we can use to make comparisons. So, so really it's, it's, it's more than just um, a, a value used for internal decision-making. It's a, it's a general concept that can be, that can be very useful, right? It can be very, very useful. Remember, remember the advantage of annual worth over present worth when we were doing uh, comparisons. And this was chapter four, comparison methods, part one. Do you remember the, the main advantage of using annual worth as a comparison method? We can, exactly right, thank you very much. We, we can compare projects 
with different time frames. And the key thing about this chapter is that we're going to look at a whole bunch of different time frames, and we're going to, in some ways, travel through time to find the best decision. That's a really good way to think about what we're going to do in this chapter. Okay, so um, I, I I don't know what TVM is. You might have to spell it out for me, or if it's if it's obscene, don't don't put it in the chat, and you can just tell me later. Oh, time value of money. <laughs> I didn't get, didn't catch that. Time value of money. Yeah, time value. Of, I I guess I should start using that acronym. It's a pretty good one. I didn't even know what time value of money money was. <laughs> oh, I am recording this, so you've got you can watch you can watch my embarrassment on that. Um, okay, so I'm just about ready to to complicate it. Okay, so. When you buy a car, for instance, you buy the car, but you're always, almost always, going to be able to sell it after. So let's say you buy a car for $1,000 and you own it for four years. And then, yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sell it. And maybe, maybe, I, maybe I sell this, this Lada. Maybe I sell it. Maybe I sell it for 800 bucks after I own it for four years. And now if, if we went back to that 0% interest, right? In a 0% in a interest world, what's my EAC now? What's my EAC now? Yeah, it's a good deal. Yeah, 50 bucks, right? 50 bucks. Remember in the 0% interest world before it was 250, but now I've got, I pay a thousand dollars now. I sell it for 800. Really, it only cost me 200 in a world, in a, uh, TVM world, I'm a quick learner, and the TVM world of 0% interest, just to make things easy, right? So in a 0% interest world, really, this has only cost me 200 bucks. And if it costs me 200 bucks over four years, then I have an equivalent annual cost of 50 bucks. But of course, we don't live in a 0% interest world. So if I went back here and I said, interest is actually 10%, okay? Interest is 10%. Now, my, my A, which I'm not gonna call it A anymore because you've already learned this new jargon term. I'm gonna say my EAC is gonna be equal to, well, if, if, I, if I'm talking about costs and if I, if I use the convention that let's say costs are, are positive, Right? If my costs are positive, then I'm going to say a revenue is negative. Now, I don't have to do that. I could come up with a cost and leave it at negative. But, and, and you can do it either way. Don't get hung up on it. The, the important thing is that the, the down arrows and the up arrows have to have opposite signs. Right? So, so if, I'm going to, if I'm going to talk about costs and make them positive, then I would say I have to subtract the salvage value and then what would be the factor that I would use, the compound interest factor, to convert a salvage value, an S, into an equivalent annual annuity? Yeah, it's A given F. Because really, this salvage value is really an F, right? In the time value of money world, the salvage value is an F because it, it's a, a value that occurs at the future. So I take the, the salvage value times the A given F, S, F factor for 10% and four years. Now I have an EAC that gives me some equivalent annual cost of ownership that takes into account the purchase price and the salvage value. Right. So, so now we're not like, you know, when we, we, we did this originally, we looked at purchasing the, you know, the junky old car for a thousand bucks. And then we assumed really a salvage value of zero. But for most assets, that's not true, especially assets that are, are worth quite a lot. You know, if a company buys some, you know, uh, buys a machine for the machine shop and let's say they use it for 10 years, I mean, that's, that's pretty good. And then maybe they don't want it anymore, or maybe it's worn out to the extent that they can't meet their quality assurance because of that machine, but maybe someone else can. So they put it on Kijiji and then they sell it. Well, that's the salvage value. And it makes sense 
that we should be able to account or to take into account what we think we're going to be able to, to sell that for at the end of our period of ownership. Okay, so so the EAC for 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 this scenario where we have a P and we also have an S, um, we, we sometimes call this capital recovery factor. And if you look in, in the in the inside back cover of your book, you'll actually see, yeah, it's called it's called the capital recovery formula, but but it has um it has kind of a different form, right? And the the, the capital recovery formula. Um, they do they use the EAC as in the so in the capital recovery formula where did it go I just had it here and I lost it um, yeah so they, they just use a but re really I'll write it like this the EAC is equal to really an annuity and and the the formula that we use is the purchase price minus the salvage value times the a given p let me see if i can remember it times the interest factor times the number for the interest factor number of periods plus the salvage value times the interest did i get it right yes okay and and i'll tell you um when i first started teaching this course um i asked the guy who used to teach the course before me i said you know how do i interpret this formula because this formula is really it's really converting a P and an S to an A. Um, and it has this little leftover term. Well, thank you. Someone has actually calculated it for 10% for the 800 and the equivalent annual cost here, thank you very much, is $143.10. Uh, oh, wait a sec, does that sound? No, that's, that's, I don't think that's right. It should be less than that, shouldn't it? For this, the EAC? Because if we have a salvage value of, of 800, if you st stick it in here, that should probably come out to less than 143. I don't know. Let, let's let's just leave that for a second. Um, I'll come back to that. But let me just finish what I was saying here. If you look at this formula, uh, like I said, I was trying to interpret this. You know, we've got, first of all, in the formula, we've got a violation of time value of money rules, right? So I'm taking, I'm, I'm adding and subtracting two numbers that occur at different points in time. And I say, ah, 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 can't do that, okay? But it's in the formula. It's like, I, so I asked the other fellow who was the instructor, how do I explain that to students? And the other thing I wanted to know is, okay, and then we have this little leftover term, the salvage value times the interest rate, the salvage value times the interest rate. And I tried to think about, what does that actually mean? And in a very interesting conversation with him, um, the two of us concluded that um, it, it means nothing. And this means nothing. What you need to do and what is actually in your textbook, if you, if you look at the A given P compound interest factor, and you look at the A given F compound interest factor, and you multiply them all out, you expand all that math, and then you collect like terms, you can factor out an A given P compound interest factor multiplied by P minus S with a little leftover bit, which is what, which is plus S times I. So don't try to interpret what this means. This is a, a derived formula that just happens to have an A given P compound interest factor as part of the mathematics that's inside of it. Okay, so 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 don't rack your brain over what this actually means. Um, and someone said, you know, I like the long way. You know what? I do too, because for me, um, you know, I I like to I like to know exactly what I'm doing. So if I calculate the EAC, I, I like seeing okay, what's the P and what's the factor there. And then what's the salvage factor uh, value? What's the factor there? But after you've done it a few times, um, you'll get comfortable with it and you'll say, oh yeah, okay, maybe, because here you can really just look up one factor. Um, yeah, so, so, um, so anyway, that is sort of a conceptual introduction to EAC, but it's only half of the story. And 
this EAC that we're talking about is has a subtitle. And the EAC subtitle here is what we call capital. So, so this formula, this idea of a purchase price, a salvage value, and then a combined sort of equivalent annual cost, we call that the EAC capital. Because what it is, is a summary of the, the, the purchase and selling of the asset sort of as an investment, right? So we're gonna invest in the asset and then convert that to an equivalent amount that's only related to the buying and selling of the asset. And we'll see in a bit as well, sometimes the installation cost of it, but, but really the, the investment amount is what we call the EAC capital. The investment amount in the project and then the amount you can recover as a salvage value, we call that the EAC capital. The other half of the story is something we call the EAC for operating and maintenance. I'll abbreviate it there. So the EAC for operating and maintenance. And the EAC for operating and maintenance costs include all of the things that you'd have to pay to keep that asset working. So if I buy the car and, and let's say the first year I buy it, uh, I didn't have to do anything. You know, the person who, who fixed it up before they sold it and I didn't have to spend any money on it. Um, and let's say I got gas for free or whatever. Okay. And then the second year, uh, some stuff starts to go wrong and I have some costs. The next year, some other stuff starts to go wrong. I have more costs in the last year. I have more costs, right? So, so here, you know, the, this would be a typical pattern for operating and maintenance cost, right? Whereas this is a capital cost and this is a capital. I won't put cost, but it's, it's related to the capital. So the EAC capital relates to buying and selling the asset and the operating and maintenance relates to whatever your operating costs are. Now that I just drew these as, a, as, as an arithmetic gradient because sometimes we, we do that. Um, sometimes we can model something as a geometric gradient. Sometimes it could be an annuity and, and sometimes it can be weird where you can have discontinuous amounts of, of operating and maintenance costs. So, um, so converting the operating and maintenance cost to an EAC. So you notice I was very careful here. I wrote this as just operating and maintenance costs. You need to do time value of money to convert it to an EAC operating and maintenance. And sometimes we just use a little subscript like that. So, so, so you have to keep that in mind. Uh, here, the EAC capital, we you sometimes write EAC subscript cap. So we'll, you'll see this EAC cap. And then we also have the EAC, we call it O ampersand M O and M. Right? And that gives us something we call the EAC total. Now, the EAC total is sort of the big picture that says, okay, over the life of this asset, what is my total equivalent annual cost? And I see that someone has actually put, I saw this before too, thank you very much, iPad. Um, and, and I think that that sounds like a, a, a correct number, the $63.10 as a, an equivalent annual cost for that. But that's, that's an EAC cap, right? It's the EAC cap. Now we could put numbers to these and we would. And, and what we're trying to do in the EAC operating and maintenance, like for operating and maintenance, we might, we might be taking something, I'll just do it a drawing. We might have costs that look you know, like this, they might be uneven. And we're trying to convert that into an equivalent or an equal equivalent 
annual, right? We're trying to convert it essentially to an A. So sometimes these require some fancy or some a lot of work in terms of time value of money. Yeah, it could be gas insurance and stuff like that. Um, oh, someone said that they think that this omits the the SI. Well, uh, maybe it does. So I I, I mean I don't, I don't know what the right answer. This isn't a proper example. This is just a made up thing. So so and someone says it does omit the the SI. Right, so so maybe that's not even the right number. It was a good try. It takes practice to get the right answer, but but anyway, I'll just come back up here for a second. Um, remember that this this might take some effort if you have different, uh, uh, let's say, um, guesses. And all of these are going to be guesses. We're going to guess what the operating maintenance costs are over the life of this asset. Then to convert them to an equivalent A, you might have to take each of these as an individual, uh, you know, dollar amount, and bring it back to the present, and then take the P and convert it to an A after you've converted it all to a P. Um, okay. Uh, okay. So so um, anyway, that's that's a that's my general introduction to EAC, and maybe before I leave it because it's kind of a, I mean, I think it's kind of a. a a good high-level um, uh, introduction. Uh, I, I think forward towards the most challenging part for students in EAC calculations, and that is the idea that these calculations are different depending on the assumption of how many years you're going to own the asset. So, so what I actually like to do is, and, and you'll see, um, you'll see some analysis coming up where um, what we what we do in EAC is we look for a special year. We're, we're looking for a special number of years, and if you think about sort of what's happening as you own an asset, particularly a car. So remember I said this kind of relates a lot to, to cars. I can, buy, I can buy a used car and it's got a cheap purchase price. And let's say I go a year and I don't have any operating and maintenance costs, but then a whole bunch of stuff start to go wrong. And then I need a new transmission, you know, and then I need a new set of tires. Um, and as those things kind of add up, right, as those things kind of add up, um, my all of a sudden my great deal on the used car is not looking so good. Has anyone had that? I mean, I've had that happen to me too, okay? But has anyone had that happen? You buy a used car, you think you get a great deal, and then you own it for a couple of years, and you think, Oh, I should have sold it last year because then the year that you own it, the transmission goes and then you're and then you're stuck. And and the pain, pardon me, the pain, the financial pain that you're feeling is you're feeling an increase in your EAC. That's the pain, right? So your equivalent annual cost just got blown up because your your transmission stopped working, your car stopped shift shifting, right? So, so that's that's kind of the point of this chapter is let's find a magical, perfect amount of time to own an asset so that we minimize our EAC. So, so I'll, I'll, I'm gonna I, I'm gonna cheat a little bit and I'm gonna give you a little bit of a preview and I, I'm gonna have proper slides on this as well and of course they're posted and maybe some people are looking ahead but don't don't look ahead right now just just um, just stay with me here for a second because I think you know understanding the concept is really kind of the most important thing um, you know it, especially in this chapter uh, it's really kind of a good chapter to make sure you know the concept. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, okay, let's pretend that I have a graph, and this graph is, let's call it number of years 
I own the asset. Okay, and this, you know, increases like a regular graph. And then this is equivalent annual cost. Now, if I buy a used car and I, I own it for, well, let's say it's gonna start at, at year zero, it starts at my purchase price. And then every additional year that I own that car, the, well, if, if interest rates were zero and I went from, if I own it for, for one year, um, it, it'll lose some, some value and I could resell it, let's say, but basically what you'll see is, is you know, the equivalent annual cost will start to go down and then it starts to sort of level out, right? And it's not a, it's not a straight line, okay? Because you've got some interest rate and, and the calculation, as we saw the calculations on the previous page, like they're not so simple because we have to be consistent with time value of money. But, but for the EAC capital, right? So the EAC cap, it, it gets lower the longer we own the asset and it kind of even approaches if you you know if you own an asset for for 100 years or you own the asset for 101 years the eac uh capital is pretty much the same okay? or or once an asset's salvage value gets to zero uh after you've owned it for a long time you know this curve starts to flatten out but the important thing is this is not costs in year one or costs in year two, costs in year three. That's not what this is. This is the cost, the EAC for the number of years I own the asset. And you, and you can say it's, it's kind of like a what if. So what's the EAC if I own this asset for two years? What's the EAC capital if I own it for three years? Now, operating and maintenance, Right, operating and maintenance. Usually, the the data is given in what what's the operating maintenance costs in each year. That's not what's graphed here. What's graphed here is the equivalent annual, and it's going to change for for however many hypothetical pretend years you own the asset. And what we see is over time, the operating and maintenance costs kind of does this. So we own assets and um, they get old, they need more maintenance to keep them up to snuff. And if, if we graph up here, so this is, this is what the EAC O&M does, right? So if that's what the, the, the EAC O&M, someone has already said, yeah, there's a sweet spot. Exactly. If I, if I graph the EAC total, you know, I end up with something that maybe looks like this, this is the EAC total. And there's a magical point. There's a magical point. This is the magical special number of years to own that asset that minimizes my equivalent annual cost. So, you know, you come down here and you say, oh, I've done my, my EAC analysis and I can tell you that this is four years. And where that sweet spot is, right? where that sweet spot occurs in terms of years, we actually have a special name for it. We call this, we call this the, the economic life. Right? We call that the economic life of an asset. And you know, if you're if you're in a company, and um, you know you're buying assets that are a lot of money, you know, in the millions of dollars. Like, you know, what if you work in a, in a, you know, a, a you know, a newspaper printing, uh, would not a good business to be in these days. But let's say in the old days you were in newspaper printing, a newspaper printing machine. You know, there are these giant machines that fill an entire, uh, you know, factory. And it might cost millions of dollars. Well, it becomes pretty important for you to monitor what are my my operating and maintenance costs on that machine every year, and what how are they trending, and then what did I pay for it? What do I think I can sell it for? And 
you should always be sort of calculating where you think the minimum EAC is going to be. And this becomes important when it comes time to decide what to do with that asset. Are we going to refurbish it? Are we going to replace it? Are we going to simply retire it and not do that process anymore? Well, if you're, if you're running a business, it's important to have this information so that you can, again, like the subtitle of the book is, right? Financial decision-making for engineers. So um, we, need to, we, need the, we need this concept to make decisions, right? Um, and and so, so yeah, so someone says, what if, if the EAC cap goes up? Well, the EAC cap uh, can't really go up. It can only go down. Right, unless unless you uh, include the EAC in the EAC cap, maybe you could include some type of a major refurbishment that adds to the value of the asset. And under sort of accounting rules, you can uh, treat a major refurbishment as an investment, so that you could, in fact put more money into an existing uh, asset um, and then continue to sort of depreciate that or spread that cost out over time. But, uh, but for the most part, um, for the most part, let's say for the purpose of this course, we will assume that the EAC capital is always going down. But it, it's a good point. If, if one of the choices was to do a refurb, you could get a, you could get a jump in the EAC capital if you put money into a, a major refurbishment, in which case that would complicate, it would create a discontinuity in, you know, in the EAC total. Um, uh, so finding the minimum might be a little bit tricky, but we, we do in fact talk about that a little bit at the end of this discussion. Okay, so, um, so someone has said, uh, so basically equating the EAC cap to the EAC O and M to get the time. No, we don't equate it. We add them. We add them and find the minimum. The EAC total, right? So, so this graph, the EAC total, is this graph plus this graph. So I take this graph and this graph and I add the two together. I mean, I haven't drawn it to scale. You know, if I drew it to scale, it might actually look more like, uh, you know, it might look more like this, where our minimum is still about, about the same place. But if I add these two together, find the minimum, that's really what I'm, what I'm doing in this, uh, in this chapter. We'll do a couple of, we'll work through a couple of examples just to help you get familiar with the process. Okay. Um, another thing I'll say about this chapter is that uh, I, I, do have, I do have three uh, pre-recorded videos. So the videos with the pink, the pink writing that I did in the McPherson studio uh, a couple of years ago. Uh, those videos are, are, are pretty uh, useful, let's say. So I, I think I have two, I, I do two EAC example problems and um, uh, doing the EAC example problems, I think is pretty, uh, pretty useful. 